Hello, everybody. everybody. We start the press conference of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation, Mr. Sergei Lavrov. And we start with the questions. Yes? Uh, I, I don't wish to provide opening remarks. I just spoke at the General Assembly. We set out, I set out our position. However, I would like uh, just uh, in pursuit to uh, comment on some of the statements that just today uh, have been heard from Washington, London, Brussels, and other Western capitals with respect to the referenda, which in uh, these days are to be carried out in the Donetsk People's Republic, the Lugansk People's Republic, and the liberated territories of Kherson and Zaporozhye Oblast in Ukraine. The hysteria which we have seen is very telling. A uh, direct uh, expression of the popular will of uh, citizens has long ceased to be a form of establishment of control over a territory which the West has embraced and supported. However, once again, I do wish to draw attention to something I have said already when in August of 2021, Mr. Zelensky, in one of the interviews, vociferously proclaimed that in the east of Ukraine, there are not even people, but uh, specimens uh, if somebody or entities, and if somebody in Ukraine, any of the residents of Ukraine uh, feel Russian, wishes to speak in the Russian language, then for the sake of the future of their children and their grandchildren, he would recommend that those people leave, go to Russia. So, if you will, he... Uh, launched uh, the process that made uh, the existence of ethnic Russians in Ukraine intolerable and ultimately resulted in the fact that on the territories of these oblasts, republics, referenda were announced on unification with the Russian Federation. As was said by President Putin, we will unconditionally respect the results of these democratic processes. Now turning to questions. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, thank you so much, Mr. Minister, on behalf of the UN Correspondent Association for this press conference. Valeria Robeco from ANSA News Web Service. My question is, uh, when the referendum are completed, uh, will Moscow consider the areas that are controlled by Ukraine as occupied territories? Thank you. The referenda are being conducted on the basis of the decisions of the local government authorities. The conditions of those referenda have been published, and following those referenda, as I already said, Russia, of course, will respect the expression of the will of those people who for many long years have been suffering from the abuses of the neo-Nazi regime. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you, Foreign Minister, for answering our questions. It's Pamela Falk from CBS News. Would you clarify your government's position on the use of nuclear weapons since President Putin's comments on the use of everything in our disposal has led to a lot of interpretation? And would that defense be applicable to the new territories that may be incorporated into Russia on after the referendum. Thank you. I wish to recall the following. It is very trendy now to use what is called cancel culture, to turn to cancel culture and to embrace it. This is uh, actively being used by our, our Western colleagues, not just with respect to certain countries, certain politicians, but also it is being used with respect to historical events. The same way as in 2014, for example, all of our Western colleagues told us, look, we cannot accept annexation of Crimea. Why did you do this? And we tell them, think back. Why don't you remember what this all began with? There was a coup. There was a huge number of people who were killed. The Putschists, having uh, torn up the guarantees of Germany, uh, France, and Poland, uh, seized the administrative buildings. They began to pursue physically. They, they followed and ran after the, president, the then president. They wished to seize him. And the first statement of the Putschists were demands to uh, cancel the regional status of the Russian language 
there were demands for Russians to leave Crimea, and Crimea, for the storm of the parliament of the peninsula, armed groups of people were deployed, and only then the Crimean people reacted with a referendum in the eastern oblast of Ukraine, responded with a refusal to recognize the results of the coup. But all of these events uh, are something Western colleagues begin to analyze with what happened in Crimea when there was no other option other than to support the sincere expression of will of Crimeans, 95 percent of whom voted categorically in favor of returning to uh, re uh, reunification with Russia where they resided for uh, centuries. The same with cancel culture. This has been seen in today's narrative, which has been unspooled regarding the question of nuclear weapons. Nobody r remembers uh, that in January, nobody mentions in January of this year, Zelensky, long before the launch of the special military operation, Zelensky announced in one of his statements, he spoke at length and continues to do so, saying that there was a m great error for Ukraine to abandon nuclear weapons when the Soviet Union was collapsing. This issue was pushed in by him into a discussion uh, with respect to how to resolve issues resol arising in Ukraine after the beginning of the uh, special military operation. The then Minister for Foreign Affairs of France, Mr. Le Drian, uh, uh, also proclaimed that the Russian Federation needs to remember that France too has its nuclear weapons. This was unprovoked and for this issue was not uttered by us at all. Zelensky began to exploit this, to use this. Le Drian also said that there are nuclear weapons in France and you all are aware of Madame Truss's comments in response to the question of the correspondent of whether it would be uh, scary for her to press the nuclear button. As for the Russian Federation, and I spoke about this, this was uh, spoken about by the President and other representatives of the Kremlin, we have a doctrine for a nuclear security which is an open document. Everything is set out clearly there. I would invite you to take another look at what is explicitly set out instances where nuclear weapon use by us is acceptable. Good afternoon. This is just our special correspondent. You spoke at the UN Security Council meeting. There were open calls by Western countries. They participated in which does this mean that you see them as a potential opponent? And how does this change the structure of relations with those countries? Um, we heard that there are, for the time being, no plans to send forces in. And the second question is, you referred to the doctrine, if the referenda on unification with Russia are successfully conducted. Would Russia have grounds for using nuclear weapons in accordance with that doctrine if there are attacks on those territories? The United States says that in that case, Russia would um, have an unavoidable strike. Uh, so serious, uh, how serious does Russia take those threats? And does this uh, transform the conflict in Ukraine into a third world war, as Alexander Vucic has said? Well, I would not here try to make any gloomy forecasts. The entire territory of the Russian Federation, which is enshrined and could be further enshrined in the constitution of the Russian Federation, unquestionably is under the full protection of the state. That is absolutely natural. And all of the laws, doctrines, concepts, and strategies of the Russian Federation apply to all of its territory. I haven't heard that the United States is already threatening strikes. I heard that President Biden said that if the referenda were conducted and their results were adopted, Russia would face some additional uh, sanctions If there is this idea that Russia will inevitably face a strike, then I will look at that text, but I am not familiar with the United States and Ukraine already being allies who are bound by such a dangerous chain. As for the legal aspects of the West's participation in this war, 
well, even people who are only slightly following the situation will see what is happening. Ukraine is being flooded with weapons. Zelensky each day demands weapons from Germany or from Israel, criticizes Israel for not providing weapons in the quantities that Ukraine is asking for or um, saying that they are not enough. And intelligence information is being provided. Satellite data is being provided. The group that is using the West to support the nationalist battalions and the Ukrainian armed forces is made up of around 70 military satellites and around 100 private company satellites. One of the commanders of the armed forces of Ukraine a while ago commenting on the use of American weapons on the battlefield said, yes, the Americans have the right of uh, veto over the targets that we are choosing. What is that then if not direct involvement in the use of lethal weapons and participation in war? And if we look at the legal side of things, the Americans NATO and the European Union say that they are not a party to the conflict. If that's true, then there are conventions that uh, apply. The Hague Convention in 1907, which is still in force, uh, no one has repealed it. It pertains to the obligations of neutral powers in a naval war and another one concerns a ground war. Those conventions stipulate that it's not just a self-declared neutral state, uh, such as Switzerland, that is covered by the term neutral, but rather neutral states are considered to be any state that is not a party to an armed conflict. And I would once again recall that neither the United States nor Europe have declared themselves to be parties in what is happening in Ukraine. And if that's the case, then Article 6 of this Maritime Convention directly prohibits the supply um, by neutral states, those not participating in the conflict, of naval ships, munitions, and any military hardware to any of the belligerent parties. So in supplying weapons to Kiev, the United States and the European Union and NATO cannot claim to have neutral status. They cannot assert that they are not participating in the conflict. Moreover, one of those conventions, I believe the Ground War Convention, prohibits directly the um, establishing of recruitment points on the territory of neutral states, and you all know how the Ukrainian embassy and the consulate generals in Europe and in other countries are openly on their websites publishing invitations to join in the holy war against Russia. That is to say they are engaged in direct mercantile activities, mercenary activities. In so doing, the Western countries that have allowed this to happen on their territory are also violating the, the Convention on Neutral Countries and in so doing have proven that they are uh, not observers, but rather are direct participants in the conflict. And one of the articles of this convention prohibits the use of telecommunications for military purposes. And as I already said, several dozen private satellites are being directly used in this war by Western governments, of course. And Starlink, a company that has satellites and ground-based infrastructure, uh, they are using this resource. And that also indicates that the United States is by no means neutral in this situation and is a party to the conflict. In electric blue, yeah. Yes, electric blue. <laughs> you mean you know all of them? Uh, I know all the colors, you know. <laughs> No, you, 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 put, you put the mic okay, under the mask. You know? Okay, now I am Marin Schmickler with German Television, ARD. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, could you please explain why so many 
Russians are leaving the country. Do in Germany have you not ratified the Convention of the Council of Europe on the Rights of Persons, which has freedom of movement? Minister, thank you. Sherwin Bryceby, South African Broadcasting. A joint communique that was issued this week after your uh, BRICS ministerial on Thursday says the following. The ministers reiterated their commitment to multilateralism through upholding international law, including the purposes and principles enshrined in the UN Charter as its indispensable cornerstone, and to the central role of the UN in an international system in which sovereign states cooperate to maintain peace and security and advance sustainable development. Why, sir, have you signed on to a communique that so obviously contradicts the Russian Federation's actions on the ground as it relates to Ukraine? And you've also just said in the uh, UN General Assembly that you support Brazil and India's permanent uh, status in the UN Security Council. Why did you not mention South Africa? Thank you. Can you, can you, can you tell me what, is, what exactly from the... Paragraph four of the communique. From the language which you... What exactly from this, from this uh, language you believe contradicts our behavior? I'll quote the Secretary General. He says that any annexation of a state's territory by another state resulting from the threat or use of no, no, force... No, 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 you're quoting Secretary General. Yes, but... I can only be responsible for what I subscribe to, and this You was... have said that you are signing... You have signed up to the principles enshrined in the UN Charter. The sure. Secretary General says you have not. And your actions well, the are on the ground in the Ukraine. The Secretary General yeah. says many things in this regard, uh, and he is commenting uh, the situation around Ukraine uh, on almost a daily basis. You, while while I have not, uh, I don't remember that he was uh, active enough uh, to promote uh, the Minsk Agreement's implementation. I will I will explain to the principles of the United Nations Charter provide for respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of states. At the same time, they provide for respect for the right of people for self-determination. And the apparent conflict between these two concepts uh, has been subject to many negotiations quite a long time. Soon after the United Nations was established, a process was started to develop the uh, understanding of all the principles of the Charter. And in 1970, in the year 1970, a consent, by consensus, a declaration of the General Assembly was adopted on the principles of relations among states in line with the Charter of the United Nations, which had a separate section, the right of nations to self-determination. There was a separate section on territorial integrity. And so the conclusion that the General Assembly arrived at vis-a-vis -vis the interpretation of the Charter of the United Nations is as follows. All states have an obligation to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of any states whose governments respect the principle of self-determination of peoples and whose governments represent all peoples residing on their territory. If somebody is to tell me now that after the coup in 2014 in Ukraine, after the prohibition on the Russian language, Russian education, Russian media outlets, after the Putschists for many long years continued to bombard the territory whose uh, population refused to recognize the results of the coup. If after all of this somebody dares to tell me that the clique which is sitting in Kiev, the neo-Nazi regime seated there, uh, pushing Nazi theor 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 theory and practice in the legislation that this regime represents uh, the interests of the people in the east of Ukraine, I would probably simply smile because for any impartial observer, it is absolutely clear that this regime completely fails to represent those people who feel themselves to be the bearers of the Russian language and the Russian culture. Everything uh, is a uh, Russian where a, a quote, if you wish to, I quoted, if you wish to be Russian, then leave. Is this representation of the interests of the people? Of course, the Secretary General has the right to make statements. This is his statement, and I signed on to what was approved at the ministerial meeting of BRICS. Indeed, there is a paragraph where we set out the fact that ministers took note 
of the approaches to the situation in Ukraine, which each country sets out in the relevant fora, including at the Security Council and the General Assembly of the United Nations, that is honest. Nobody says in unison, everybody has different views, there are nuances, so we simply took note with respect, well, those of us, of the five, what we say at the international stage. Uh, you see about, again, uh, cancel culture, you didn't quote me in full. I said that we view India and Brazil as strong candidates given they are leading international players as strong candidates for permanent membership of the Security Council with the condition that at the same time, in the same way, the profile of Africa will be raised. I mentioned India and Brazil for a single reason. They have long officially advanced their candidatures. As for South Africa, the Republic of South Africa, this step has not been put forward in African countries. Members of the African Union are committed to the Isolahini, Eswalhini consensus that was arrived at many years ago, and this is their collective position. However, addressing the question of expansion of the Security Council without meeting, uh, reflect, reflecting the interests of Africans is not possible. Again, I emphasize that we are talking exclusively about expansion of the Security Council membership with the representatives of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, because if we are to talk about an additional inclusion in the Security Council of Western countries, well, that would be humorous for a number of reasons. I will set aside the fact that they are all hostile and the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China, two of the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China. But if we uh, set aside political assessments, most importantly, any Western country, what new will, uh, what will it provide uh, the, that is new to the Security Council, to the table, it, nothing, absolutely nothing. They cannot provide absolutely new, uh, nothing. They are all following the orders of the United States, Germany and Japan, who also announced their official candidatures. Just read what they are saying, what they are doing. And now, even if we step away from political assessments, setting them aside at the present moment of the 15 members of the Security, Security Council, six represent the Western group, next year there will be seven because Japan will be added, whose policy, of course, is not an iota different from that of the United States. Good afternoon, Ilya Petrenko from RT Television. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask a question. Sergei Viktorovich, I have a question about a situation that might not be directly related, but I would like to draw a parallel. On the one hand, there's the head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, who uh, essentially is openly threatening Italy with consequences if at the, the, the outcome of the elections in this country is not agreeable to Brussels. And then on the other hand, there were the referenda in Donbass, where when they were declared, uh, almost immediately uh, European and American politicians said that they were unacceptable and began to uh, compete with describing them in unfavorable terms. What is this approach to votes from the people and how does one react to that? It's high-handedness, it's arrogance, it's all-powerfulness, this feeling of being all-powerful and a sense of one's own exceptionality, exclusivity, in that they are the only ones who have a right to judge. What Ursula von der Leyen said about the Italian elections was extremely high-handed because such threats is something I do not recall any EU leader making in the past. But in principle, the European Union is becoming an authoritarian, harsh, dictatorial entity. This is no secret. Everybody is already well aware of this. But each year on the margins of the General Assembly, we have many bilateral meetings. And this year, as in previous years, there was a planned meeting with the President of Cyprus, Mr. Anastasiades. Upon his request, we included him in the schedule at a time that was convenient to him. That schedule was published uh, both on our side and the Cypriot side. An hour before we were supposed to meet, 
Mr. Anastasiadis's protocol informed our protocol that the European Union was not allowing him to do this meeting. Quite literally, that's what they said. That's no secret because Mr. Anastasiadis's office in Nicosia on the same day made a statement saying that the meeting had been cancelled due to the need to adhere to a European Union regulation of some sort. Two further countries from the European Union and one NATO member country also wanted to have a meeting with me. They asked for that meeting to take place behind closed doors for it not to be reported. I said, sure, however you like it. We're never going to say no to contact and we'll always be ready to accept a format that is comfortable for our partners. Having got that reaction, they suddenly fell off the radar. We didn't hear any more from them. So that's the way things are. When President Macron spoke, and I've even brought a quote with me here, he said that this is not the time for war. The time is not for um, revenge on the West or pitting the West against the East. But we never pitted the West against the East. The West simply decided that it didn't want to cooperate with us. And then he said, the time is one of our sovereign independent states to together deal with the challenges that we are facing. These are excellent words. But as an illustration of this, the permanent member of the Security Council uh, in New York and the capital established a rotation for coordinating members among the P5. From the 1st of January, for three months, one country coordinates the actions, and then that coordination role goes on to another country. Now, in September, Russia is the coordinator among the permanent members of the Security Council. And each time the General Assembly takes place, that respective coordinator, whose country is at that time the coordinator, holds a meeting of the ministers of the five permanent members of the Security Council together with the Secretary General. As polite people, we also extended such a proposal. We got the agreement of the Chinese side, but the Anglo-Saxons informed us that they were not intending to engage with us. So you can judge for yourselves. When the West says, let's mediate, we'll mediate, and someone comes up with that idea, or why is it that you don't want to have any contacts with us? It's, we've never stepped away from contacts. Everything has been destroyed and continues to be destroyed by Washington and London instantly more and more actively, as well as Brussels and the European Union. And on the subject of the referenda, well, double standards, as you said. You remember how the West established an exception from international rules for Kosovo, but then the International Court of Justice said that there was no such exception at all. And then, in principle, after Kosovo, it was declared that any part of the territory of any country has the right to determine their own future without the consent of the central authorities. It's um, double standards. Where they're uh, advantageous, they'll do what they want, and when they're not, they won't. With uh, China Central here. This is the issue with China Central Television. You just mentioned the participation of the Western countries in this conflict. Uh, we know that the biggest um, uh, uh, arm dealer here is actually the United States, who passed several packages to send, arm, uh, send weapons to Ukraine. Um, even the foreign policy of the U U.S. said that, that U.S. politicians now they are trying to play the long game. Uh, what, what do you think is the intention of the United States and and is Russia ready for a long game with the United States in Ukraine? Well, the Ukrainian game has been ongoing for quite some time now. I would recall that back in 2003, 
when the latest elections were held in Ukraine, the preparations were underway at the time, Western politicians, officials, minister, the minister for, uh, the, for, uh, the for minister for foreign ministers, including the Belgian foreign minister, I remember this perfectly well, he explicitly proclaimed that Ukrainians uh, during those elections need to determine who they were with, with Russia or with Europe. And this kind of a mindset, this philosophy, either them or us, hasn't disappeared, and the way that today the, we see the Russophobic trends which are raging rampant throughout Europe and the Europeans and Americans are trying to bring the whole world into this disgraceful policy, the actions of the West at the moment when immediately uh, as a, a, a Russian Russophobia, regular Russophobia was was encouraged and the, the Russian language prohibited. This is racism, which apparently didn't uh, disappear. It wasn't, it's no longer latent. It is now obvious. And this is being spread and proliferating. The same with those slogans, Ukrainians choose who you're with. And a few uh, years later, there were other elections. The candidate that was not uh, embraced by the West didn't win. And the West did everything possible to raise a wave in Ukraine and to compel its subordinate Ukrainian officials to uh, t uh, hand over the issue to the Constitutional Court. And the Constitutional Court, which is supposed to su uh, protect the Constitution, set out a third round of elections, which is not enshrined in the Constitution, and the necessary candidate for the United States was then selected. So you know, in December of 2013, there was a publication of what leaked uh, the uh, recording of the television uh, the dis discussion between Victoria Nuland and the American ambassador in Kiev. The, the American ambassador in Kiev was being reported to, this was back in December, about which politicians, was reporting which politicians need to be prepared for the new government even though uh, there was more than a year before the elections, so a certain likelihood of an abnormal uh, transfer of power, power was possible, and Newland named a few names which he thought had to be included in the leadership of Ukraine. And to this, the U.S. Ambassador in Kiev said, well, you know, this specific individual, he is not supported by the European Union. Do you remember what she answered? Fuck the EU. So this is the relationship. This is the truth. And the relationship today is the same. The whole coup, the turnaround with Germany, France, and Poland signed on, their ministers signed on to a guarantee of the creation of a government of national unity, which would deal with preparations for early elections in five to six months. During those elections, the opposition would certainly have won. But instead of complying with the agreement, and at least respecting the authority of European countries who, who placed their authority, at, their authority at stake. The following morning, they didn't wait very long, the next morning they seized administrative uh, buildings and then at uh, the they, uh, uh, square they proclaimed, uh, celebrate, uh, uh, congratulate us, we created a government of victors, not na of national unity, but a government of, victor of victors. There's a big difference here. And this was something that was seen repeatedly, the fact that the United States views the current situation around Ukraine as, as some kind of a, of, of, a, of a yardstick by which their capacity will be measured to remain a hegemon. This is absolutely clear to me. I'm not comparing the situations. However, when the United States uh, launched their aggressive misadventures in Yugoslavia, in Iraq, in Libya, when they invaded Syria without any right to do so, they, and in Afghanistan, by the way, also, they announced areas of their interest in areas tens of thousands of miles from American shores. And in parallel with these processes, when they sowed chaos everywhere to then have uh, the American fish fished out of those muddy waters, they advanced NATO eastward, eastward, and further eastward. NATO, a defensive alliance. When the Soviet Union existed, uh, when there was a Warsaw Pact, when the Berlin Wall was up, a concrete wall and an imagined wall between the two blocks, 
Yes, it was understood that they were defensive. They were defending themselves from, as they viewed the aggressive Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact. But then there's no longer a Soviet Union, no Warsaw Pact, and they're now defending themselves hundreds, tens of thousands of kilometers from the line that was then understood. They simply decide, okay, we will defend ourselves here. Then we will defend ourselves there. They announced that NATO now as a defensive alliance is accountable for security in the Indo-Pacific region, as they put it. So the next line of defense of NATO, the line of protection, will be the South China Sea. I have no doubt about that. Today I spoke about this during the general debate. How long will this situation go on? I won't guess. A president was asked and the response was, we see our purposes which were proclaimed. We are working towards the achievement of those goals. Since we have a new meme on TikTok, Please. <laughs> new what? A new mem. Mem. That was it? Yeah. EU, something about EU and sex. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Minister Lavrov. Michelle Nichols with Reuters. Uh, we've heard Russia's explanation for its invasion of Ukraine, but could you tell us what the end game is? Is the end game to overthrow the government in Kyiv? And how much pressure is Russia coming under from China to end this war? Uh, the goals of the operation have been set in President Putin's statement on the 24th of February. We cannot tolerate. Tell me, for example, uh, and I try to allude to some of the things which are absolutely intolerable. If, if, imagine for a second, Reuters, right? Uh, if uh, Ireland prohibited English in schools, in uh, communications, in uh, movie theaters, or if Belgium did the same to the French language, or Finland to the Swedish, can you imagine any of these uh, developments? I can't but with, it would have been considered outrageous immediately. And there would have been a scandal and action, I, I have no slightest doubt, not to allow this to happen. But in case of Ukraine, for long, long years, the policy to eliminate anything Russian never drew any attention from uh, media outlets uh, in the West and not only media outlets. We have been presenting these cases and calling for some action in uh, OSC, Council of Europe, United Nations, in relations between Russia and NATO, which at that time existed, in our context with the European Union, zero. Just like in the previous decades, after the Soviet Union disappeared, uh, our insistence that the European Union must end discrimination of Russians in Latvia and Estonia were not heeded at all. Absolutely. We have very deep conviction that our Western neighbors have racist instincts vis-a-vis -vis Russia as a country, Russia as a nation. If you have any, uh, any, any fact which will disprove uh, what I am just saying about discrimination of Russians in Estonia, Latvia, and in Ukraine, where legislation was passed prohibiting everything, then, of course, uh, we can, we can uh, discuss what analysis uh, you might offer. So, uh, you call it aggression, uh, uh, you call it annexation, it's, it's your right. My answer is very simple. Don't try to judge from your office or from New York. Go to Crimea, talk to the people. Uh, nobody does it except uh, some brave politicians uh, who are not in the elite, you know, system uh, systemically. Go to the East. Anybody of you, did, did you go to, to Donbass during the eight years of the war, when the Minsk agreements were raped every day? No. The Russian TV was broadcasting the situation on the Donbass 
side of the line of contact, daily life. And the damage to the civilian infrastructure, the killings of the uh, peaceful population was broadcast regularly. And we have been asking a question. Why uh, don't Western journalists do the same on the Ukrainian, sorry, but Minister, on, on the Ukrainian side uh, of the uh, line of contact? Because on the Ukrainian side of the line of contact, the damage was inflicted only by return fire. And it, it would be seen immediately. So uh, I understand that you want to ask a question which would allow you then uh, to write that I uh, could not answer your question, but... I no, think, I'm, I'm after what's the military endgame. We understand your I was just asked by our Chinese friend about the military endgame and the, the goals of the operation. You should read Putin more often and carefully. He announced everything on the 24th of February. Read it and you will, you will get it. And what about China, pressure from China to end the war? This, this I don't understand at all. Your, your president said last week that President Xi had raised concerns about the war with President Putin. Did he say, did he say pressure from China? He said did he say pressure from China? He said concerns. So no, no, no. I'm, I'm asking yes you. Yes or no? Did he say pressure from China? I'm asking you, though, are you coming under any pressure? I don't know. I'm asking you. No, 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 no. You ask me what about how do we feel under pressure from China? No, said, Look, let's be, let's be honest. Are, are let's you be coming honest. under any pressure from China? Uh, look, you may, you may uh, tell your readers, listeners, viewers uh, that uh, I avoided your question, to answer your question. Uh, you mean you don't understand Russian? Still. High time to learn. Sergei Viktorovich, on the margins of the General Assembly, you've had many different meetings with your colleagues from Africa. Could you please tell us, during those talks, first of all, did you discuss the um, situation surrounding Ukrainian grain and Russian fertilizer, which is in European ports, and which our now probably former Western partners are refusing to release? to these poor countries. And second question, from your point of view, are there any new tracks or new areas that have emerged during discussions of these issues with American partners? And in general, in your point of view, how is the dialogue with African countries developing? Is there anything new or interesting that we don't yet know about? Yes, we spoke with many African colleagues. We spoke first and foremost about our bilateral relations with each of the African countries. We have growing trade and investment activity, although, of course, the overall figures are still a long way behind the Europeans and particularly behind Chinese companies, but the prospects are very promising. We have a lot of projects and a lot of plans, and we are putting together a robust package of agreements for the second Russia-Africa summit, which we plan to hold in the middle of next year. Food security, of course, is of interest to everyone. Everybody supports efforts to end the barriers that have been erected by the European Union, London and Washington in respect of the export of Russian fertilizer and grain. Everybody welcomed the package deal, which upon the initiative of the Secretary General was concluded on the 22nd of July in Istanbul, and which at long last forced Zelensky to demine Ukrainian ports he had been refusing to do that since March. In March, Russia and Turkey proposed that he let through um, those ships that he was holding hostage uh, because of security cones in international waters to the uh, Bosphorus Gulf. That was agreed to finally, and Ukrainian grain did leave. However, the poorest countries 
on the World Food Programme's list, there was a terrible situation in Burkina Faso and another country as well. The Europeans, we pointed out to them that almost half of this grain was going to them. We were told that it would then be reshipped re to African countries. But nevertheless, one way or another, it is operating. As for the Russian side of the deal, the Russian part of the deal, neither food nor fertilizer uh, as a heading, is uh, as, as a line, is indicated in the sanctions of the European Union and the United States. But other things are mentioned. For example, Russian vessels docking in European ports, the docking of foreign vessels in Russian ports. Sanctions are imposed on Rosselhoz Bank, the main agricultural bank in the country, which services the lion's share of all fertilizer and food deals and transactions. And, of course, against the backdrop of these threats, that the West is flying around left, right, and center. The insurance rate for our vessels has increased fourfold. The Secretary General, in that part of the 22nd of July agreement that pertains to Russian grain, is obliged to get the European Union and the United States to lift these obstacles. I met with him the day before yesterday, and he confirmed that he, there is still a lot of work to be done. As he has said publicly, there are still barriers, but uh, they are giving him some promises. So everything is in the hands of the hegemons who are trying to shift the blame onto us. Because nobody went hungry when the USA was bombing Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya for years, Syria now, when the war is ongoing in Yemen. Did that have an impact on global markets? No, it didn't. But that's because uh, back then there were commanders who were exercising their sense of all-powerfulness. And then suddenly those Americans decided that they would not allow crops, the Russian language, the culture to be destroyed. And that's the difference. And that's when this package of sanctions was ramped up, something that no one has ever seen before, and which was introduced without any concern about those developing countries which would be impacted by the sanctions as they have been. Thanks for doing this. Alan Dorgan from MTV Lebanon. Can you please elaborate more what's the role of the Saudis and the Turkish in easing the crisis? They showed will to uh, join forces maybe to help maybe solve this big crisis that's happening between these two nations. And can you tell us if they are communicating with each other before uh, bringing any draft or any try uh, to give any help to the Russians? <laughs> uh, many are proposing their mediation uh, services to us. With respect to Turkey, Turkey played a very useful role when it invited uh, parties uh, to Istanbul, the Ukrainians, the Russians, and representatives of the United Nations where an, a deal was reached, which I mentioned. Now, we are expecting from the Secretary General and from the Turkish side, because they are now parties to the agreement, we are awaiting from them that they seek to ensure that the Europeans and the Americans lift those barriers that I mentioned for the implementation of the Russian part of the deal. Because the Russian grain on world markets represents an immeasurably greater share, far more significant than Ukrainian grain. I didn't even mention, incidentally, 300,000 tons of fertilizer have been shut in European ports, not being released. And for approximately a month and a half ago, we said our companies are willing uh, to, uh, to, to abandon the rights to the fertilizer for them to be quickly sent to developing countries in need. And this is something which many are very interested in. The European Union for a month and a half has been thinking and thinking, unable to take a decision. Uh, the fertilizer is no longer ours. It is uh, now in the hands of the European Union. Let them give the fertilizer to the countries who are on the list of the World Food Program. Turning to Saudi Arabia, 
there was an announcement that the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman participated in the agreement on the details of an exchange that was held. Uh, their mediation services is something which many have been proposing this to us, but we wish to understand what will come of this. Without any mediators, in March, in late March of this year, we reached an agreement with the Ukrainian delegation on the principles for a settlement. Those principles, which the Ukrainians themselves set out, we accepted them without any changes whatsoever. And the next day, changes began. They said, well, this isn't right here, it should be different here, and then the provocation occurred in the city of Bucha, where the Russian the troops who withdrew from the area as a gesture of goodwill liberated the area. A mayor emerged of the city for two days. He spoke on television, described life there, and on the third day, the, the broad street was broadcast where corpses were littered about for two days, being in one city for two days. The mayor and his entire team, and uh, discovering this on a, a major central street on the third day, well, that's actually a mockery. I would like you, too, to, uh, to exert influence on Ukrainians and their friends. For a number of months now, we have been requesting because everybody insisted a meticulous investigation into the events in Bucha. For a number of months, we have been asking for the names of these people whose corpses were broadcast on television and, the, and on the Internet. The answer is complete silence. I even mentioned this during a Security Council meeting. And I then requested for a, a polite meeting. Uh, uh, during, during a meeting, I asked Mr. Guterres whether uh, he could get involved in this for an explanation. A scandal was created. This was used for another package of anti-Russian sanctions. There were demands for an investigation. And the first step to an investigation is what? At least to establish the identity of those individuals which the Russian army allegedly killed uh, in an atro uh, with such brutality. And then recently there was this story with the city of Izum where there was an announcement of a grave, a mass grave of tortured Ukrainian residents, and uh, a, a, a cemetery was shown with graves indeed, but no mass grave. Every um, a grave had an orthodox cross, so people were interred. They were buried, and the Ukrainians began to unearth them. For your investigation, there was interest from a host of journalists foreign correspondents to travel to the area, to see this for themselves, and the Ukrainian leadership is not allowing them in. And as for Zoom, nobody's writing anything anymore. This is something that is noteworthy. Please pay attention to this. Now is a time when there is a temptation to sensationalism, but interest in uh, those who create these sensations without checking the facts. This is rising under these circumstances and in these times. In regions of this ballroom, Evelyn and Edith. Please, two questions, one by one. How do you do? Um, you have spoken in detail about NATO encroachment. Do you see, perhaps after this war ends, that whether you call it a war or not seems to be one, um, any kind of talks with the United States to make Russia feel more secure about what you call NATO encroachment? Well, you know, I've already said today, and I'll repeat it again, we're not saying no to contacts. And when proposals to that effect come in, we agree. If our partners want to meet quietly so that nobody finds out about it, that's fine, because it's always better to talk than not to talk. But in the present situation, Russia is quite simply not going to make the first step. Everything was destroyed back in 2014 when the European Un Union destroyed the 
architecture of relations we developed with the European Union, we've told them that when they have an interest in something, they should let us know. We would have an interest in that. Just wait and see. And then on NATO, in the peak of the talks of how we should establish European security, they expelled almost all of the staff of our mission to NATO, apart from eight people who were left, a driver and some technical staff, which is not serious at all. So we closed that mission, or at least suspended its operations. Those mediators that are stepping forward, I've responded to them. We've heard lots of proposals to that end. I said, well, listen to Mr. Zelensky, who said that we'll beat Russia, we'll liberate everything, and in my peace plan there's no neutrality provided for, with the idea that they need to be accepted into NATO. Do you know how the Americans view Europe? There was a phrase that... The Ukrainian nationalists started uh, saying a long time ago, Ukraine is Europe, but I think the Americans would like to say the opposite. They'd like to say Europe is Ukraine. Kuleba, in response to the question of whether Ukraine wants to enter NATO after Zelensky said that there's no space for neutrality in our peace plan. Kuleba said, well, now NATO is going to join Ukraine rather than Ukraine joining NATO, maybe for political uh, satire. That is a, a promising thing. But if they come to us, We'll consider it, but we're not going to take the first step. We've drawn the conclusion that they are in no way willing to negotiate. They are um, selfish through and through. They are egotistical, and they think only about themselves and their interests. A balance of interests is not something that they will respect or even pursue. The representative of Reuters asked, and then someone from Germany The nature of those questions is something that the elite in Western countries needs in order to continue to demonize Russia. But those questions did not reflect any interest whatsoever in the way that you asked your question about perhaps there could be dialogue. So let's see. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. And um, you're back in an old home. Um, Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Um, this week we have listened to heads of state and heads of government repeatedly call for an end to this conflict in Ukraine which has had global ramifications. Mm -hmm. We've also heard um, military experts saying that um, there seems to be no desire on either side to negotiate because they believe that they can win militarily. Um, how would you respond to both of those um, views? Well, yo, je I have already responded partially. I will once again state, as soon after the launch of our military of our operation, the, uh, the Ukrainian side proposed the beginning of negotiations to find a way to settle the situation. We consented. A number of rounds of these negotiations was held, first in Belarus, then online, during which the Ukrainians couldn't even understand what they were uh, couldn't even explain what they were proposing. Then there was a proposal for Istanbul, 29 March, during which 
we were uh, sent a paper setting out the principles for the settlement, uh, and to this um, paper we responded favorably without any change whatsoever to those principles, and uh, we uh, put those principles on in the language of a treaty. We handed them over to U the Ukrainian side. Then there was Bucha, which I mentioned, and the names of the victims, which we uh, continue to wish to see, and we will continue to ensure that this be uh, done. Then the Ukrainians told Ukraine, don't agree to an agreement with Russia. Right now, you need to gather successes on the battlefield. Burrell, who should be dealing with uh, diplomacy, the main diplomat, said that this conflict needs to be resolved on the battlefield with the victory of Ukraine. Take a listen. Well, you listened to, to Boris Johnson before, but now listen to Liz Truss. They all say approximately the same thing. And NATO, everything else, and Crimea needs to be taken away. What kind of negotiations can be even considered? The last thing that happened in terms of contacts with the Ukrainians was our consent to their paper on the principles for a settlement. After this, they moved in a completely different direction. Read Zelensky's statement the day before yesterday. No compromises, our uh, peace is war, etc. I don't know what else can even be talked about. There is a one group of mediators who I met with here, distinguished international, eminent international regional organizations, and they tell me, let's travel to Kiev and what should be conveyed there. And I said, well, you know, I told them they suspended, halted the talks, after which in the middle of the summer they asked Putin, why has Russia refused uh, negotiations? He responded, we have not refused negotiations, but those who are refusing need to understand that the longer they refuse, the more difficult ultimately it will be to reach agreement and to negotiate. So uh, we again, again, we showed our goodwill. And the other side doesn't uh, wish to embrace this and the parties to travel to Kiev soon. I asked them, did you speak to the Americans? Have you been speaking to the Americans in terms of your mediation? They fell silent and they said, well, our mandate only includes negotiations with Russia and Ukraine. Why is this serious? Uh, any a thinking person, does, does any thinking person truly not understand that the United States is calling the shots in Ukraine and in, in, in Ukraine and increasing in London as well? It is all crystal clear. And when the questions are put forward by journalists from Europe, from England, from the United States, why are we not willing to engage in contacts? They prohibit it. I said this. They prohibited uh, the president of Cyprus from having negotiations, from having a meeting with me. One member of the P5, another, also a distinguished, uh, representing a, an eminent side, somehow timidly uh, uh, requested a quiet meeting behind the scenes, and they fell off the radar subsequently, just like another prime minister. So. There is no need to label us as uh, someone refusing a uh, refusenik. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last one. Thank you.